I'm Jason Harmon, and this is API Intersection, where you'll get insights from experienced API practitioners to learn best practices on things like API design, governance, identity auth, versioning, and more. Welcome back to API Intersection. Uh, here again today with our co-host, uh, Adam Devander, and a lovely and old friend guest, uh, Lindy Brandon. Uh, it says your name's Lorinda, but we call you Lindy, and that's okay, right? That is totally great. And nice that I didn't have somebody that had to ask how to say their name in a knew their secret name, which is even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Lindy, uh, you have been a lot of different places with interesting and big names and others not so well known, uh, but always in the API scene everywhere. Uh, I know Adam and I have ever been. We end up hanging out with Lindy and, you know, uh, catching up. And it's been way too long and our pandemic friend hasn't helped. Uh, but Lindy today is at Better Cloud. And I guess maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing there and, um, you know, kind of where you have fit in the API world over the years. Yeah. So I just joined Better Cloud. I just passed my three month mark. So a whole quarter I've been at Better Cloud. Um, I'm the VP of engineering there. So I run all of the software development uh, teams. And Better Cloud is for people who haven't heard of it. Uh, we are a SaaS management platform. So what that actually means is we're geared towards the IT professionals. So, you know, if you think about, especially right now, we were talking earlier about all of the transitions going on, people leaving their jobs and joining new jobs and all of the companies that are moving to the cloud and embracing SaaS because, you know, they've got a remote workforce. It's a lot easier to do it that way. Um, that means for IT folks, um, that's a lot of onboarding and offboarding and permissions and security issues with files that are shared and knowing which files are being used and which applications are being used um, in your organization. And that's what Better Cloud does. So we're a SaaS management platform that we integrate with just about everybody. And um, so we're, we're deeply entrenched in third-party APIs. We are big API consumers. Um, and we basically create an interface where IT admins can come in and do things, set up workflows and do things with one click, you know, so I need to onboard a bunch of employees, you know, that's better cloud automates that for you. So you just, you know, set up a workflow, hit a button and magic happens. Magic that relies a lot on APIs. <laughs> <laughs> no. And yeah, we, we were discussing my background at Zapier and all of the unique problems you get to see when you are using more APIs than anyone else. So, anyone else. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to dig into some of that today. Welcome. Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's a bit of shift of gears. We've talked a lot about how to build APIs and you know microservices and externalizing this huge big picture. I think today is like a fun reflection on the other side. Um, I personally reflect on this a lot that. What got me started and being fascinated in APIs was using a couple of really crappy ones and feeling like I could do better than that, and I'd learn about it. Um, so uh, I don't think I've ever been in the better clutter, zappier position of like consuming tons of things, but everybody I've ever met that does that always has interesting insights, and I think that's what we want to like drill into with you today. Um, so uh, I don't know where do we start. A, that's a, I feel like that's a big subject and you guys are both, it's in your wheelhouse. So where do we go with this? So I, I can give, you know, Adam, definitely give me your perspective because I think you've walked in a lot of the same shoes where I, you know, moving from, so I was at Capital One for a number of years and helped build their API program platform, all of that um, with a, a large number of very talented, brilliant people. Um, and in that space, we were creating APIs more than anything else. And we were worrying about how do, how do we present ourselves as good providers, right? How do we provide the right documentation and the right portal and the right experience when it comes to versioning and change control and all of those things. Um, and then 
I went to Twilio, which is also an API provider. So again, you know, focused on all of that developer experience, you know, what does that relationship look like? What do you worry about when it comes to, you know, the kinds of things you expose and how do you, how do you make money off of that? And then going over to Better Cloud, where we do have an external API, but our core skill, our core strength, the core thing that we do is we consume APIs. And so, you know, we all, all three of us have gone on stage and told everybody, here's what you should do when you're providing an API, right? And as a consumer now of so many APIs, you look around, you go, wow, like we all heard the same words and we all have the same checklist, but how we actually accomplish that checklist, really different. And, uh, you know, how we interact with one API provider is not necessarily how we can interact with another API provider. And so we have to adapt constantly all day long to different ways of consuming APIs, consuming documentation, working with DevRel, all of those things are different company by company. And when your business depends on it, it's crucial that that work for you and that you can context switch enough to get your work done. I don't know, Adam, if you've had the same experience, but like that's been the enlightening part of Better Cloud for me. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm curious for, well, and first of all, I think if we've, if we look at the themes that we've heard on this podcast so far about consistency within API programs and how you don't always have control over what was the case before, and you're trying to make things better now, but you're still, I think a lot of the same problems some of the listeners are dealing with internally, just the same as having to deal with these multiple approaches to APIs. I guess the difference being that you have a lot less control over someone else's API, yes. but what are maybe those knobs that you do have to be able to even understand where the where the gotchas are? Yeah, and I I feel like some of the things that I'm learning now, um, being on the receiving end of of people's programs, people's API programs, is. Um, you know, when your business depends on somebody else's API being performant, um, being dependable, being understandable, the need to have a direct line to people who can answer our questions quickly, right? Because we're struggling with incidents that come up and we're trying to figure out, is that us or is that them? And is, where is that delay happening and why? Are we not using their API correctly? Did they change something? Mm -hmm right? Or are they having their own performance problems? And, you know, every provider communicates with us a little differently. And we have to communicate back to them a little differently. And so I feel like some of the knobs you can turn, I know we've said this in many different forums, but one of the biggest knobs you can turn is your developer relations, right? We are the developers and we need a relationship, um, but we need, we need a really robust one. So in some cases, you're talking to DevRel who can't answer your questions. They are basically conduits to engineering teams, and that's not helpful to us, right? We have engineers who just wanna to talk to people who really have in-depth knowledge. There's other DevRel organizations that do have in-depth knowledge and can like be right there running proof of concepts with us, right? They can, they can duplicate things that we're seeing and say, oh yeah, I see what's going on. Let me get this endpoint corrected. You know, they, they can actually um, help us get out of the situation that we're in. And so I think it's, it, it's, it's easy to say, I'd love them all to be the exact same thing. I also know that not everybody has the same budget, the same, you know, emphasis on their external APIs. So I get that it can all be the same, but that's, that's what to me is the biggest pain point and is some, it, uh, something that a provider can really help tune um, for people like us who are consuming so many APIs. 
So it's interesting. You said like, we've got to build a relationship, this developer relations function, you know, probably exists if there's, you know, some kind of significant API service. I will say, um, you know, one of the things I tell people all the time is don't have your like dev rel group report into marketing because it should do more than that. Right. Um, right. I mean, yes. because it's like, they're not just there to sell the API to people in a sense. Um, so that's one bit, but you did say like, they, they have this conduit to sort of the product development or engineering, which isn't enough. And so I, I want to drill into that. Are you seeing that kind of more dedicated like API support function to answer questions and like fill in the gaps is there or is it um, more of like kind of an infrastructure relationship as far as direct uh, connection into engineering or ops or something? Um, I think... Well, let me give you some examples. I, I'm not naming any names particularly, yeah. but let me give you some examples of things that really work well for us. We have a couple of providers that we have a shared Slack channel with. And we know that, that some of those people are product managers on that Slack channel, and some of those people are marketing um, who are worried about events and want to talk to us about events. And then there are some people who are engineers. So we can go in with any one of our many questions, right? Sometimes it's, hey, we notice we're getting lag alerts from uh, this particular function in our, in our product. We think it's related to your API. Is there somebody who can look at that, right? So we want somebody who can look at logs and get back to us quickly because we have a deprecated function in our system. So our customers are suffering. But on the other hand, sometimes we just want to say, you know what I wish you had? I wish you had this in the payload, or I wish you had this endpoint. You know, who do we talk to about getting that on your roadmap? In that case, we want the product managers. So there's never just one type of interaction we need. It's like any other product. I mean, we've also, this is also something we've said for a long time, right? Your API is a product. And so it's like any other product. You need to talk to, we're your customers. We need to talk to you on multiple levels sometimes. So having run lots of APIs and programs myself before, been a big, you know, uh, heavily involved, some of what you're describing sounds horrifying in the sense of like <laughs> all these people using the API can just ask random questions and everyone has to jump. Like, um, I guess like it doesn't sound very scalable, but I also know that the flip side of like, you know, file a ticket and we'll get back to you within 48 business hours when like, you know, your, your thing is down, <laughs> like you're losing money. Right. Um, I, I guess in terms of like, uh, are, are there middle roads between the, the intense relationship of constantly hearing from everyone and waiting, you know, waiting on a queue of tickets? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, we, that's the exception. What I just described is like the perfect scenario for us, but it is the exception to the rule. The, we're perfectly happy creating support tickets for things that are not urgent. And get back to us when you get back to us, at least we know you know, you know we're reporting an issue or we're asking for a feature or whatever it is. Um, but there are times when things are really urgent and we can't wait for that and we we, for the most part, our big API providers, the ones that really drive the most business for us, um, we have account managers and we have a way to escalate to them and say, I need to get, <laughs> I need to get somebody engaged. And sometimes that's a DevRel, sometimes that's like a more of a TAM um, type of person, but they need to have access to create urgency on their side, right? And not all of them do. Sometimes, you know, and I, I've worked in this. I've managed TAMs, so I know how this works. <laughs> and so I'm deeply sympathetic to the situation that they're in, and I, I get it, but also, like, our business is suffering because we are reliant. And this is the world we live in now, right? This is this is, uh, the, you know, the old saying, be careful what you wish for, right? This yeah. is what we all wished for when we were all running around in the early stages of APIs. And we were all going, everybody should have an API. And oh, the magic that happens, you know. Well, the magic has this like 
dark side to it of we <laughs> rely on each other now and we're still in many ways um, working in an old model that doesn't um, doesn't acknowledge the reliance we have on each other for our own businesses to be successful. So I think that's part of our um, the maturity that we now need to figure out how we adapt to. I'm going to take a quick... So the dark magic of APIs is a great headline that <laughs> I think you should absolutely use if no one has used it yet. And I look forward to reading uh, that. <laughs> that article uh, the uh, one thing that occurred to me as you were saying that that in those discussions that you have with the company regardless of, of what what the conduit is uh, this was something that was the case at Zapier you have a customer in common and in your case that's probably a pretty big customer because they have enough of an onboarding issue yes. that they need to automate all of that does that sort of framing things in the in the uh, in terms of the business benefit uh, help you in those conversations? Uh, not that I've noticed. <laughs> 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 so I, you know, maybe I should do it more often and do it more loudly. But um, here's here's the thing, right? We are we do have big customers. And so we are, we are hitting those APIs like crazy. We run into rate limits every, you know, few minutes because mm. we literally are processing millions of transactions in in a day, and the amount of data transport that happens in our system is pretty amazing. So we we are a big customer of these APIs, right? We're paying for this access, and we actually um, make good use of it and have to increase our rate limits pretty frequently. So I, I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to encourage our organization to think of and to take the stance of is we're the big customer, right? So mm -hmm. um, yes, we have big names, big logos who are our customers, but um, to those APIs, we're the big customer. Yeah, no, I, I think it's incredibly insightful. I mean, I I like that you've you've mentioned some of these corollary functions, like uh, correlate to serving APIs that we wouldn't always think about as an operational need. Is um, you know, kind of DevRel or you know evangelist types, account management, um, product people, like stuff that if you go, what does it take to run an API? This wouldn't necessarily come to mind first, but. Yeah. Um, it's like, I, I think I always dreamed that, gosh, if we had people that really knew the API super well um, and could answer those questions amazingly well and have access to all the right data and the right engineering people to just get it solved, wouldn't that be great? But um, I feel like there's a, there's like a, it's, it's a weird hiring place of like, if someone knows it that well, they're going to be an engineer and just work on it. But if they're an engineer working on it, they're shipping new value. <laughs> Who's left, right? right? Who's in the middle of all that? Um, and to your point, who recognizes the business context like an account manager would to understand that, yeah, you're the big customer, Lindy. We're going to treat you right. Um, so it's a weird gap. Um, all right, well. Um, I, don't think, I don't think as an industry we've solved it, yeah. right? We, we've, that's what I was saying earlier is like we still have some we've created this method of building products that relies on each other in an ecosystem that isn't built for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's and, funny, I, yeah. and I, you know, I think all of the, the DevRel things that we all talked about <laughs> was so small scale compared to what the world really looks like right now. Yeah. Um, and so I don't have the answer for what it should be. I just know that it's frustrating to have to navigate all the various ways that people have interpreted the yeah. need. You yeah. know? No, it's funny to, to people who don't necessarily work in APIs and integrating big platforms and, you know, they go like, I go, well, it's that, you know, APIs are kind of that thing that happens when you press the button on your phone to do something. 
And, right. and if it's integrated with something else, it is a messy, grimy, dirty business that you don't want to know about. <laughs> so right. I think don't that might look be, under these covers. <laughs> yeah, that might be our summary for today, which is great. Like I, I think, you know, uh, two listeners, you know, if you like know a pattern that works well for this, tell us about it. We want to hear about it. Hit exactly. us on Twitter. Um, so I guess I think uh, that, uh, support sucks. One of the things, <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, and uh, well, one of the things in the the sort of the the business case not necessarily hitting the mark uh, kind of does go along with some of the things we've heard from other guests about it. Yeah. Just connecting, you have this super technical thing which is APIs, and that needs to connect to the business. Uh, the business strategy and the and requirements, but that's not always obvious to everyone who sees it just as this as this technical yeah. thing. And I think that happens on the as you're building an API, and that happens clearly uh, as you go to attempt to consume all of these APIs. Also, yeah, um, we, we talk all the and, time about that disconnect, right? Like between the business. Yeah business uh focus and the the api focus and how like do they even line up half the time so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but it's and, good well point. and i you know i look at the way that we have attempted to solve some of these issues is with a great open format open api uh which again is focused exclusively on on those sort of technical aspects i know you've been involved in that for a while maybe talk about how it has so far helped solve some of the issues we've had. And I don't know, is there some answer within, within that movement? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so obviously, you know, this is like a passion of mine. Uh, I've been involved with open API since it was founded because <laughs> I was on the swagger team. Um, I, you know, I think it's a great, obviously I, I'm a fan of it. I, I think having a standard that we adhere to so we can have easier conversations and easier ways to adopt each other's APIs, you know, we can, we can use all of the tooling with our third party APIs, right? If, if we can go to a provider, which we do and say, hey, can you share your, your um, open API definition with us, we can plug it into our tooling and we can create mocks and then we can do our testing and we can do all these things. And we don't need to bug you for a sandbox, right? Because we can do it ourselves. So there's lots of benefit to having that kind of standard. Um, and we are actually on our own journey at Better Cloud. They had just started before I joined of, of embracing open API for our own APIs. So our internal APIs are starting to standardize around open API. And we're going to be looking at our external API to make sure we standardize that as well, because that it, it helps uh, to have that kind of common language. Um, but I'll tell you the thing that has been the most valuable to us, and, and um, I, I say this in all sincerity. <laughs> I think most people will, if they know who I am, are going to say, oh, she's totally biased on this. But I say this with all sincerity, and I think the Better Clouders would back me up. When I joined Better Cloud, we joined the Open API initiative. So we became a member company, and that gives us access to all kinds of Slack channels and people and meetings and initiatives and working groups and whatever. Um, and the, the amount of learning that happened was so rapid, right? Because everybody's out like doing their own, you know, before we joined, the better clouders were out doing their own research, reading this blog, reading that blog, looking at this GitHub repository, trying to piece together all the stuff. And then we joined OpenAPI and they had access to all these people and all these other companies who had already tackled some of this, right? And they could go in and say, how'd you do this? And get all of this input. And they had access to everybody, you know, the async API people and the open API people and GraphQL and like all these experts in all these different areas. And so um, that is, I think one of the, you know, we talked about like, now APIs are so pervasive that we all rely on each other. This is the 
you know, that was the dark magic. This is the real magic, right? This is the sparkly magic of, of we're all in this together. And if we can find each other and find these communities, there's so much knowledge that we can share and so many of our experiences that we can share. And sometimes the people that we are relying on, those companies are in that group too. And so we can have conversations with them outside of just, I need to escalate an issue to you, but hey, let's learn this thing together or teach me how you came to this place, right? Um, I, that is, as, as you guys know, like to me, the API, the community aspect of the API world has just been near and dear to my heart from the beginning. And I think the Open API initiative has that in spades. And, um, and so I think that's the real benefit too, is not just the Open API spec being a common framework for all of us to use, but this OAI community being this group of people who are learning and shaping the API ecosystem is, is really valuable. Yeah, I, I signed on from the start when I was at PayPal, uh, when that all kicked off. Um, ended up kind of jumping out of that, I don't know, frankly, because living in, uh, in Spain for a couple of years, uh, everyone wanted to do stuff at lunch on Fridays, and I'm like, I'm not doing this thing on a Friday <laughs> night. But uh, now back at Stoplight, obviously, you know, we're a big kind of, in a way, an open API tooling provider and part of that community yeah. too. So yeah, it's like, I think there's a lot of other interesting stuff out there and like new ideas coming together and things taking hold. But man, out of making sense of the REST API world, I think open APIs really opened it up. And that's, uh, I wouldn't say it's where it's going, it's where it's at. Um, and that's not, not just because I have, you know, uh, I'm CTO at a company that uh, certainly puts a lot of stock in it. But even if I wasn't working here, I'd say it too. You see it going on in people that, that work in this space. Cool. Well, that was uh, quite a an awesome open API pitch, a dark, depressing black hole of grimy messes <laughs> between platforms. And, uh, <laughs> but hey, that's, you know, I, I think it's an awesome counterpoint in some ways that we talk about these idealistic notions of building great API platforms and what it really takes. And at the end of the day, like get somebody on the phone. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure would be nice when your API Can you embed somebody in our breaking. office? Yeah. yeah. No, I love it. I love the reality check. Um, so, And I, that's where the conversation about providing goes too. Yeah. in the end yeah. is, yeah. is being able to provide provide an API that answers the actual questions requires actually talking to people who are going to use it. So yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting that both ends of this kind of end up at that collaboration, but maybe not that surprising to the three of us and uh, hopefully not to many of the listeners. And if I can just provide like a parting thought, right? I, I watched, a, I was watching a landscape. <laughs> this is how exciting I am, but I was watching a show about this landscaper, a uh, documentary about this female landscaper uh, at a time when there weren't female landscapers. Um, and she, she was really a landscape architect, but she talked about desire paths and about like watching a space before you start planning the public gardens. She was a public garden. She designed a lot of big public gardens watching the space to see where people walk before there are pathways, because then you find the desire paths and then you put the walkways where the desire is. And I think I, I see that also as sort of a guiding principle to API design of thinking about what do people want to do with your API? Not what can they do, but what do they want to do? Where are they trying to walk? And are you creating a path for them? And I think as a consumer of so many APIs right now, it, it's become so visceral to me to be thinking about it that way. Where do we want to go with your API and how do you create that desire path for us? Wow. Uh, this is why I love doing this podcast. You get to talk with smart geeks like yourself who think deep, <laughs> it's beautiful. No, I, I think we've, we've hit this a lot on the show that like, let's not forget the word design and API design and that it's at the core of everything. Like yeah. you can't get around that problem. And if you didn't do that homework up front, everything else is going to eat you up later. 
and design work, if you hang out with designers, is a little soft and fluffy and met metaphoric and asking fundamental questions. And, uh, you know, you can't get away from it. You got to do it. So I love it. It's beautiful. Lindy, thank you for sharing. Adam, any uh, any parting thoughts on this one? I feel like this is in your in your world, in your camp. Anything to add? Yeah, I I mean I think it's what's I happening at your house. That's a conch Adam? shell. Yeah, <laughs> I I clearly said the one o'clock hour was non conch hours. I I made that clear. <laughs> Maybe your village uh, needs help. Maybe that's, that's a right. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, I think, I think the, the call to action being to open up those conversations and, uh, yeah, look for ways. Maybe it's not this shared Slack channel if that's, uh, too high fidelity, Terrifying. but finding, finding, you know, finding ways to be able to have those, uh, conversations with yeah. others. And yeah, I, that was important uh, too. that's, yeah, that's what I'm, uh, pulling away. And yeah, thanks for, uh, for being part of this episode. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great to talk about this stuff and great to see you two again. And so appreciate the invite. Can't wait to hang out and have some drinks together in person again soon. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you have a question you want to ask, look in the description of whichever platform you're viewing or listening on. And there should be a link there so you can go submit a question and we'll do our best to find out the right answer for you.